The women play a key role in maintaining peace in any conflict area. They are advocates for peace, mediators and caretakers of anyone affected by a conflict. I spoke to Ambassador Jacqueline O'Neill on her role as Canada's ambassador for women, peace and security and what it means for women in Africa. So I'm Canada's ambassador for women, peace and security, which is a position that the government of Canada created to make sure that as a government ourselves in Canada, we're really shining a light, a spotlight, a focus on issues related to women's meaningful voices in all aspects of peace and security. And so I have a, a role that relates to working with Canadian institutions, our police, our military, our foreign affairs department, as well as, as many domestic departments to look at women's leadership within our institutions, to look at ways that we're serving women in communities uh, in Canada. And then we also have a mandate internationally. So Canada's a very proud champion of gender equality and of women's leadership uh, all around the world. And so I have a, an amazing job where I get to to travel to beautiful places like Kenya uh, and hear what women are doing here, how women are organizing, uh, how the government is adapting institutions and creating uh, different ways to ensure that Kenyans' women's voices are influencing peace and security in as many ways as possible and then plan to go back to Canada mm -hmm. uh, and bring some of the lessons and insights that we've heard about over the trip uh, the last few days uh, into our practices back at home. Right, I'm expecting you to tell us about your trip a bit later, but Women, Peace and Security first made its uh, you know, onto the Security Council agenda in 2000 with the adoption of the Security Council, you know, that is 1325. Um, what is the Women, Peace, Security agenda specifically focusing on? I loved that you brought, you referenced the origin of this, uh, this movement and this activity. And something that we always emphasize, regardless of where we are, is that we have this agenda, this Women, Peace and Security agenda, largely because of the leadership of African women. Uh, so it's been African women uh, who have been connecting with women around the world saying, we play very, very similar roles during conflict. So we fight as combatants, we deliver services in communities, we urge parties to be negotiating, we mediate between warring parties. So even when people live in very different cultural contexts and parts of the world, uh, they have very similar experiences in that regard, including in the fact that when it comes time to create formal processes to resolve conflict, uh, to create new constitutions, to reform security forces, etc., women are largely excluded. So African women very much led the way uh, in advocating to the UN Security Council to say this is not just an issue that relates to women, it's an issue that relates to peace and security for all of us. Uh, and then it was actually Namibia that brought forward the resolution to the Security Council. Canada was on the council at the time, we were very supportive, uh, but it was really African leadership that brought this, this issue to an international space. And so uh, the essence of the idea is, is still very much the same. It's the idea that not only do women have a right everywhere in the world to participate in decisions that affect their lives, but that when they do, the outcomes are better. Uh, and so we see this in all kinds of fields and all kinds of spaces in peace processes, for example. We now have information and data that uh, peace agreements are 35% more likely to last at least 15 years when women participate meaningfully in drafting them. We know from security forces that when women are included, forces have better situational awareness, they have better understandings of communities, they have better capabilities because they, tap, they draw from a broader selection of talent within their communities. Uh, we have lots of evidence now to indicate that this is actually true, uh, that when women have meaningful roles, that everyone benefits. So, uh, so while it's called Women, Peace and Security, it's something that really relates to all of our safety and security. And that's why uh, Canada is committed to this at home, uh, as well as supporting partners around the world like Kenya, who are, are dedicated to ensuring that women have, play the roles uh, that they can. Uh, in peace and security issues. Maybe from a personal experience point of view, I know you've been in Sudan at some point, mm. and that country is still in conflict as we speak, yeah. So what was your experience there, especially with women, with regard to the yeah. conflict and peace yeah. resolution? So I often say that uh, Sudanese women were my very first teachers about women, peace and security. And around the year 2005, I was lucky to work uh, both at the UN peacekeeping mission that had just been set up, and also at Afad Women's University in Khartoum. 
And at the time, uh, there was very little connection between the two. Uh, so members of the international community were trying to support the government of Sudan, the newly formed uh, uh, government of Sudan, on things like how to reform the public service, how to draft a new constitution, uh, how to integrate security forces. Um, and there were a lot of women in the community who had very important opinions on this, who were scholars, who were leading community organizations, uh, and they, weren't, they didn't have ways to connect or opportunities for connecting. Uh, and so part of what Women, Peace and Security about is about is ensuring uh, that voices in communities are able to influence formal processes. And so it's absolutely devastating what's going on in Sudan right now. And unfortunately, I think it's a, a reflection of many institutions not taking those voices in, on the inside and, and taking them into account. Sudanese women in particular have been tremendous community organizers, are playing leadership roles, have very strong visions for their country uh, and yet have been excluded from a range of processes and institutions that have unfortunately led to the, the crisis right now. So, you know, Canada, I know Kenya and many other countries uh, are very much hoping and working to ensure that moving forward, we're not simply uh, replicating the power structures that led to this crisis in the first place, mm -hmm. but that the aspirations of Sudanese people truly representative uh, groups of Sudanese people can really define and shape the future of the country. And that's been a real personal influence for me uh, to really be able to see the ways that, in different ways, that Sudanese women, uh, Kenyan women, Canadian women, um, that we organize and that we, we seek to influence our own lives. So 107 countries have now established the national action plans on women, peace and security. Now to advance, of course, this agenda on peace, women, peace and security. But first, just for people to understand, what does national action plan mean? Great questions. So, a national action plan, which as you mentioned, now the majority of countries uh, have, and, and the, the largest uh, number of plans, actually, let me restate that. The region with the largest number of plans actually is Africa. I think there are around 33 plans on the continent right now, um, have these national strategies. And what they are, just ways to take this concept, this international principle of women's inclusion, which again came from the grassroots, uh, and, and bring it to life at a national and community level. So most of these national action plans, Kenya's plan, Canada's plan, it includes multiple departments across the government. So uh, like Kenya's in Canada, we have uh, um, actions from our foreign ministry, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Gender Affairs or Women's Issues, uh, Ministry of Justice. We have multiple departments that work together and say, we, we think this is important. We want to adapt uh, our processes, our systems, our ways of funding, our different models of support to ensure that we have this whole of government approach to increasing women's leadership and increasing women's meaningful participation. Uh, so these plans are, they state the government's ambition. Uh, they give communities and civil society organizations a, a roadmap or a vision that we're trying to accomplish so they can help to hold us accountable to doing that. Uh, and they help us organize amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. Specifically for Canada, how does the National Action Plan work? So Canada has 10 partners in our National Action Plan. We have uh, Ministry of Defense, Foreign Affairs, Interior, Police Service and others. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a focus on ourselves. We're not only looking externally on this. So we have uh, two departments who are partners uh, that relate to Indigenous peoples in Canada. And that's a reflection of uh, in Canada, we recognize that we have barriers to the full participation and meaningful inclusion uh, of women in our own security institutions, in particular with Indigenous women who face a crisis um, within Canada itself. It's also a reflection of the fact that we know that within our own institutions, uh, many of them have uh, traditionally been male-dominated, uh, that we need to really look at and evaluate uh, how we recruit women into all of our institutions, uh, their experiences when they are serving within them, and also the ways that all of our, our, our institutions in Canada, our police, our military, our diplomats, uh, those in government serving Canadians, that how we're making sure we understand the different security threats and the different issues that, uh, that women face in communities. Mm -hmm. So as an example, more and more we, have, we are facing uh, natural disasters or events related to climate emergencies in Canada, like floods, 
like fires. Uh, and so some of part of what we're thinking about is how are women affected by these in, by these disasters differently than men? How do we serve that? What are the most effective ways to communicate with communities in emergencies so that they will listen to, uh, to instructions to evacuate or what to do uh, and really try to understand how we can be as effective as possible in responding to them. Right. You've been in the country for a couple of days mm -hmm. now. Um, it's not your first time vis visiting Kenya for sure, but why are you in this region at this particular point? Are there specific projects that you're involved in and you'd like to tell us about? Sure. So on this uh, visit to the region at this moment, uh, we're visiting three countries. We just came from Ethiopia uh, and a little bit of time in specifically in Tigray as well. Uh, and are heading next to Mozambique, which will be exciting and where I've never visited before. Uh, but as you mentioned, have been to Kenya and work quite a lot with Kenyans around the world. So even in, in Tigray, where we just were, uh, we're meeting with the African Union team that is verifying uh, implementation and, and that the parties are keeping to their commitments in the peace agreement mm -hmm. uh, in Tigray, and it's led by a Kenyan general. Uh, when we're at the United Nations, uh, we are often engaging with Kenyan colleagues and counterparts. So Kenya is a really important partner for Canada uh, on a whole range of issues and where we work together very closely. Uh, Kenya deploys a very high proportion of women to UN peace support operations. Uh, Canada is really interested to learn more about um, you know, how you're preparing men and, and women soldiers to deploy, etc. So we're, we're here to understand a little bit better what we can learn uh, from Kenya, to strategize together about how we can work together to influence um, peace and security in the region and, and deal with some of the crises that we're facing, uh, and, uh, and really to just strengthen our relationships together as a country. Culturally also they're a bit, uh, they don't look at women in a certain way. So, is there any projects that you're involved in there that just to educate women and create some form of awareness? In Ethiopia at the moment, one of the things that Canada is supporting is support to survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. So women in particular, although men as well, uh, who've been, uh, been victims of sexual violence committed in particular by armed groups. And we were able to meet with a number of survivors who are trying to get the health care that they need, to get psychosocial support, to be able to re-enter back into communities. So Canada is very um, keen and, and is investing a fair amount in supporting survivors of this really horrific violence and in recognizing that conflict-related sexual violence, as we call it, um, rape as a weapon of war in, in other terms, uh, really understanding that it's used strategically by armed groups. It, it's not the same thing as um, domestic violence or other issues and to really support survivors of that and to help them seek justice wherever possible as well. Uh, we're very much uh, providing a fair amount of um, support for humanitarian assistance given the, the crisis related to um, food security and the supply of food. And we're, we're very um, concerned about a lot of the, the issues that people have raised about just survival at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and as always, we're interested in uh, how uh, peace can be brought about through negotiation, through dialogue. Uh, what are some of the processes that are undergoing, such as a national dialogue process in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. that can really help to understand what are some of the root causes of conflict, what's going on uh, in ways that we can, we can support the resolution of conflict and dialogue that will present, prevent this escalation of violence that you're referencing. I'm curious, why Mozambique? <laughs> Uh, Canada is very uh, engaged in trying to support Mozambique uh, to support or to to ensure that peace uh, endures in Mozambique. We'll also be visiting Cabo Delgado um, and and really trying to support national efforts to ensure that peace actually takes root uh, and engage it and uh, endures. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up the interview now. What are you hoping to see maybe in the next few years when it comes to women, peace and security, more inclusion more participation? I think the single most important thing that can happen is for all of us to have more women in decision-making positions. Uh, so not just kind of women recruited into different organizations at very low levels and then we look at the numbers and say over there, overall they're fine, but for us to really say that whenever there are critical decisions that are being made, should there be a military response or not, 
Uh, how can we make sure elections are secure? Um, how can we ensure that when there's a, a, a conflict that is brewing uh, regionally, that we are intervening with mediators who are skilled and knowledgeable and include a significant proportion of women? Uh, I think that's the single most important uh, dynamic that we, we will see to really change the outcomes. And um, when we talk about vision, my vision is that we no longer have to make the case as to why it's important for women to be included and instead people will look around a room at some point see no women included or just one or two and say wait this is this is not right we have to change this mm -hmm. right thank you very much can i add one point you referenced before that um yeah uh, about specifically in kenya and, and canada's work for women and girls can i say a word or two about that go ahead um so canada's very keen also to support uh, women and girls in Kenya and we're doing that through a number of different ways that are consistent with this idea of women, peace and security. So we have a program called Women's Voice and Leadership where we're trying to support movements of women, uh, feminist organizations, women working on women's rights issues uh, and to provide core funding so that they're not trying to just deliver projects or services but really organize overall. Uh, we have a, a significant focus on women's economic empowerment and inclusion uh, in Kenya and trying to support women to gain economic independence, economic power, et cetera, recognizing connections between women having uh, power and autonomy in their own lives and them participating in, in decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, also, we're working with the Kenyan Defense Forces, National Police and others uh, to support training that integrates attention to women's leadership within it. And this is something that we, we collaborate very closely with Kenyan colleagues on. It's something that we're trying to integrate much more into Canadian practices. But looking at things like, first of all, how do we recruit and retain more women in, in police and security forces? Uh, how do we ensure that we're promoting them and at levels that are commensurate with their skills and, and, um, and qualifications? Uh, and then also, how do we train men and women in these forces to engage with women in communities. So how do we recognize when there is conflict-related sexual violence? How do we understand uh, and work with people where peacekeepers are deployed to understand the priorities of women in communities? So uh, we've really been uh, encouraged by a lot of the, the steps in the leadership that the Kenyan defense and, and police forces are taking to prepare their own organizations and their own soldiers and police uh, to work with communities. My Chino specific country, uh, not country town, or city in Kenya that this project is supposed to be happening? So just yesterday we visited the International Peace Support Training Center uh, that is run here in Nairobi uh, and it's really a, a regional leader and I would dare say international leader in terms of training uh, police, military and civilians who are going to be deployed to UN peacekeeping operations, peace support missions, uh, missions elsewhere uh, and, and they're training them 